Let's continue that prayer together. Heavenly Father, we come before your word asking what we just sang. We recognize our worship before you is not what it should be. It certainly is possible and is ever being renewed by the supernatural work of your Holy Spirit through new birth and through sanctification, and yet it is not what it will be. We long for the day when the gap between our worship and song and our lives before you is narrowed to nothing. We long for the day when what we sing with our lips resonates precisely with how we live and what we think and the motives in our hearts. In the meantime, God, we worship you. We worship you because you are the one most worth adoring. And we recognize that our worship is imperfect. We love you. and We ask that you would help our lack of love for you. Help our unbelief. Fill in the gaps of our knowledge of you with truth from your word. Fill in the holes in our lives with that which must change. We thank you, God, for the church and for the gifted people you've placed in your body and for the benefits that they give one to another, that we truly have each other's backs, that we look out for each other. We are our brother's keepers and we want to do so for your glory in ever-increasing interdependent love and care for one another. We pray this morning that this text before us would help us to that end. That we might love you all the more. And that your church might resonate with its intended purpose and with its necessary message. And all for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn your Bibles to Romans 15. While I get my eyeballs. That's better. Driving a car is a constant set of course corrections. You're never going precisely where you want to go. You're always meandering, meandering from left to right. You're never going exactly the speed you want to go. You're always going slower or faster than you want. And the goal in driving is to make those course corrections sooner and smaller, mile by mile. We are in second round of driving school in our household. And I had a recent driving lesson, or I gave one. And a certain daughter of mine, I mean a driving student of mine... <clears throat> Uh, found that we were facing the sidewalk rather than the road ahead. Uh, she had become consumed with the dashboard, which is a fairly common phenomenon. I want to make sure I'm going the right speed. How do I find that out? The speedometer, where's that? Is it that one? Nope. That's, was that oil temperature or pressure? Sped, speedometer. All of a sudden, before we found out what speed we're going, we were facing 90 degrees the wrong direction. I grabbed the wheel, and we course corrected back into the lane we were supposed to be in. I asked the student a couple of weeks later, were you offended when I grabbed the wheel? And she said, I would have been offended if you let us all die. <laughs> Great student. That's what I'm talking about. And so early on in your driving career, you were making big corrections, and perhaps you had the temptation to look right down at the road and that dashed line over here and that solid line over here and make sure you were in between them and you're just trying your hardest to stay in between them. And eventually you learn to lift up your eyes and look down the lane and see the horizon and make those course corrections sooner and smaller. The Christian life is a series of course corrections. We're not what we were. Christian, you are not a slave of sin. You're no longer under the dominion of darkness. But you're not yet what you will be. And there is growth to be had in the Christian life. And the aim point of our growth is Jesus Christ himself. He is the standard unto which we are all to grow up into Christian maturity. 
The standard for Christian maturity is not the Christian culture around you. It is not the people closest in your home or your family or your workplace. The standard is Jesus Christ. And we are all together making course corrections, aiming at the standard of conformity to Him. Nobody is beyond the need of a grab of the wheel. Nobody has graduated from the need for course corrections. Uh, graduation is to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And that's when we've passed driving school. And one of the significant means that God has provided for course correction in the Christian life is in the passage before us this morning, the next verse in Romans. So if you're not there already, I'd invite you to turn to Romans chapter 15. And we're going to be picking up a new section of the book of Romans. This really is headed towards the finish line and the ticker tape of this magnificent letter. Paul has sort of summed up, wrapped up most of his command sections of how to live the Christian life after having given chapter after chapter of what the Christian life is on the basis of the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross. And he says here in verse 14, And now concerning you, my brothers, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. That is the text we're looking at this morning. And the main idea of this text, it'll be on the screen for you, is that Paul expressed confident expectation for Roman believers' ministry to each other. Paul expressed a confident expectation that Roman believers had what it took to do ministry with one another. We're going to look at their equipping and their specific task. We'll look at why Paul had this confidence. But I want you to recognize, first of all, that this is a remarkable thing Paul says because Paul had not yet been to Rome. He did not found the church at Rome. He didn't plant the church. He had not yet spent time there. And the church at Rome, by the time Paul wrote this letter, had existed for approximately a decade. Paul's confidence here is emphatic in the original. He begins by saying, my brothers, this is a warm, affectionate, personal address. And he says, I myself am also fully persuaded concerning you that you yourselves are. And Paul is in the original loading up pronouns here, emphasizing a, a, an emotional statement of affection and conviction related to the adequacy of the Roman Christian's ability to do ministry with one another. And Paul is confident of this. Now, if we go back to Romans chapter 1, in verse 7, Paul introduces this letter this way, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, and listen to this verse 8, because your faith is being reported all over the world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit and the preaching of the gospel of his Son is my witness, how unceasingly I make mention of you. Speaking of prayer, always in my prayers making request, if perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you so that I am, may impart to you some spiritual gift that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us encouraged by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that I planned many times to come to you and been prevented from doing so until now so that I may obtain some fruit among you, just as among all the Gentiles. It's clear that while Paul had not been there in person, he had been with the church in heart. He was familiar. He knew people by name. He loved them, and he prayed for them warmly, personally, persistently. Paul knew and loved this church. And when you get to chapter 16, Paul gives us a list of names, and, and we'll walk through these. We'll, we'll devote an entire sermon to each one of the names in Romans 16. I'm just kidding. 
Emmanuel said, amen. I heard that. (laughs) But just listen to the names that Paul addresses here of people that he knows personally. Priscilla and Aquila, fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risked their own necks. He says, greet Epinetus, my beloved, who is the first convert to Christ from Asia. Mary, Andronicus, Junius, Ampliatus, Urbanus, Stachus, Apelles, the household of Aristobulus, Herodian, Narcissus and his household, Tryphena and Tryphosa, Persis, Rufus and his mother, Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermas, and the brethren with them, Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who were with them. That's a lot of names personally in this church where he has never yet been. Some he had met in prison, some he had led to faith, many were those with whom he labored in other parts of the world in his travels. These are people with Paul. Uh, There were also people with Paul as he writes the letter from Corinth who send their greetings to the Roman believers, and Paul names them, Timothy, Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, Tertius, Gaius, Erastus, and Quartus. These are all people who are presently with Paul in Corinth as he's writing this letter that the Roman believers would know by name. And so something really striking is on display here. Paul knew much about the church at Rome. Paul knew about the character of the people there. Paul's awareness of their reputation for holding on to the truth and believing the true gospel had already gone all over the world. Paul knew many of these people in the church. He knew the reputation of the church, and he would have known from others what the church was like. And that knowledge obviously flavors the entire letter. What Paul says in verses 14, and I'll read verse 15 along with it, is he is convinced that those believers at Rome are adequate. They have what is required for a very specific ministry with one another. And he says in verse 15, But I have written very boldly to you on some points, so as to remind you again because of the grace that was given to me from God. And what happens from verse 15 to 21 is Paul goes on to describe that grace given to him by God. It's the name he gives to his specific ministry as apostle to the Gentiles. And he calls it a grace gift from God. He doesn't deserve to be an apostle, doesn't deserve to be a believer, doesn't deserve to be the one selected by Jesus to take the gospel to the Gentiles. That is only God's undeserved kindness to him. And he unfolds that. And we'll look at that next time we're in Romans And the argument he's making in verses 14 and 15 is this. I am convinced of some things of you Roman Christians, but I have written boldly in order to remind you of some things because of the grace given to me. In other words, because of his responsibility as the official emissary of Jesus Christ to the Gentile world, (laughs) the one given the task of articulating New Testament truth and the gospel for the Gentiles. He wants to be in Rome, to strengthen them, to establish them. But his teaching of them at Rome is not like some of his ministries elsewhere. And it's not like the ministry he aims at beyond Rome. He wants to go places where Christ has not been named. But of this church at Rome, where Christ has been named and named well and been believed, and that belief has a reputation that's spreading, Paul has written boldly so as to remind them of some things. Now, this is important for verse 14. As we see the word boldly, this isn't a sharp rebuke like Paul's letter to Galatia or perhaps Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Um, and those are places Paul had spent time and, and the familiarity that he'd had with those groups of believers may have afforded him a little bit sharper tone. Maybe he's reserving some of that here with the Romans, but I think more likely he just hasn't been there yet. And so he has a little bit of trepidation about the forwardness with which he has said some things boldly. And by boldly here, I think he means all of the commands that he's just laid out beginning in 12.1 all the way through chapter 15. He spoke into their lives. He gave directive counsel. He told them what to do. He gave imperative after imperative after imperative. Imperative. 
And some of those are positive instructions about what to do, and some of those commands were warnings about what not to do. Paul was giving course correction from 12, 1 and following. And he may, be, he may have in his mind in this word boldly the very strong teaching that he gave in Romans 9 to 11 about the sovereignty of God over his redemptive purpose for both Jew and Gentile. And in a Gentile city with a Jewish population and then a church with a mixed Jew-Gentile population, those Jew-Gentile relationships could have been tense. And so teaching on God's plan of the ingrafted branches into the rich root of the olive tree and then teaching on preferences in 14 and 15 would have been very important. Strong words from the Apostle Paul, bold instruction from the Apostle Paul, but necessary. And he says all of this was given, verse 15, to remind you again. There's a subtle indication here that the Roman believers, in many senses, were operating on all cylinders. They had truth by which they were operating, and Paul's instruction to them was significant reminder. Paul was using here his uncommon apostolic ministry to the church to encourage believers' common, ordinary ministry in the church. As apostle of the Gentiles, he, he was the only apostle Paul there was. He had unique gifts, unique calling, unique responsibilities. But now he is employing all of that unique ministry set as apostle of the Gentiles to encourage a very common and ordinary ministry amongst the Roman believers. And that's what verse 14 is all about. It is an ordinary, expected, regular ministry of believers. Look at it again. Paul says, And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are, and here's three outline points for our message this morning, full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to admonish one another. And I've outlined them this way. Number one, impelled by a right motivation. Why did Paul believe that the Roman Christians were able to have this kind of ministry with one another. First of all, because they were impelled by a right motivation. And he says they are filled with goodness, full of goodness. And goodness here is defined as a positive moral quality that is characterized especially by an interest in the welfare of others. It is a goodness, it is that positive moral excellence that has especially in view this interest in the welfare of others. It is not just an intrinsic goodness bottled up inside, but it is that goodness that gets outside seeking the benefit of other people. And Paul says, I'm convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness. Earlier in this letter, Paul said, no one's good, not even one. What happened between Romans 3 and Romans 15? The gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, there is a transformation of life where what we bring to the table intrinsically is worthless before the Lord, offensive before the Lord, and when God gets hold of your life, He begins a transformative process and produces in you things you could not produce yourself. And he says of the Roman believers, I am fully persuaded that you yourselves are full of this moral excellence characterized by an interest in the welfare of others. It's good. And apparently he knows that by reputation. He knows that by conversations with those who have been back and forth from the church at Rome. Look, the kind of goodness that Paul is describing here is not possible if you're not born of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 lists this very same word for goodness as part of the package, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That is, that which is produced by the Spirit of God in the life of a believer. That package, by the way, which is a demonstration that the Holy Spirit is in you. And Paul says, I am convinced Roman believers... 
that you are full of that goodness. So that is the very goodness that was going to be required of the Roman believers to live out all of those preference issues in love for one another that Paul's been detailing for us for the last chapter and a half. And Paul says, not only are you full of goodness, not only are you impelled by a right motivation, number two, he says, you're supplied with sufficient information. You are supplied with sufficient information. Notice what he says, and concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are filled with all knowledge. Filled with all knowledge. Uh, the verb tense here is a perfect tense. The idea is having been filled with all knowledge. They, they stand in a present state of having filled themselves up with truth or having been filled with truth. And by the way, knowledge here or all knowledge is not omniscient information. It is rather sufficient information. Paul is not saying here that the Roman believers somehow have a supernatural tap into knowing everything that could be known, every single fact there has ever existed, all knowledge. That's not what he means here. He's talking about all that knowledge that is sufficient for the ministry he has in mind, which he'll detail at the end of this verse. That is a comprehensive understanding of God's truth sufficient for life change. A comprehensive understanding of God's truth sufficient for life change, for dealing with the problems of life, and for living out a God-pleasing existence. That's the knowledge that Paul is convinced the Roman believers possess. And up to this point, the church at Rome did not have, for instance, the book of Romans. <laughs> Paul's writing, and I guess as soon as they read that, they had it. Now you've got Romans. Now you've got everything you need. I think Paul had in mind something prior to the book of Romans. Again, he's writing these things to remind them of truth that they possessed. Even though they had not had the apostle Paul teaching them, they did have the scriptures. Consider 2 Timothy 3.16 for a moment. Paul wrote to Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. Profitable for what? Profitable for teaching for reproof, for course correction. I added the word course in there. For correction and for training in righteousness. Now, what scriptures were in view in 2 Timothy 3.16? The sacred writings in context would be a reference to the Old Testament. And I believe Paul refers to his own teaching earlier in that context when he says the things that you've heard from me, Timothy. That is, apostolic doctrine and the Old Testament scriptures, side by side, together in God's self-disclosure for the benefit of His people, were profitable for teaching, correcting, reproof, and training in righteousness. The Roman believers had the Old Testament. They also had apostolic doctrine, even though Paul himself had not yet been there, they had apostolic teaching by proxy, those who had been with Paul, those who had been with the other apostles, perhaps those who resided in Rome who had come to Jerusalem in Acts 2 at the day of Pentecost, heard the gospel, believed in Jesus, heard apostolic teaching during that time, and went back to Rome. There, of course, were the Jews who were expelled from Rome for a time and dispersed in other places and may have interacted with apostolic teaching and then came back. Certainly, the church at Rome had some solid teachers. Priscilla and Aquila are named. The believers at Rome had God's truth. When Paul says they have all knowledge, they have been filled with all knowledge, Paul is referring specifically to that knowledge, that truth, which comes from God, which is sufficient for the task Paul is about to lay upon them. That's your third point in your outline. Paul was convinced of the adequacy of the Roman believers for the task of ministry with one another because they were equipped for an important occupation. That is, they had what they needed to accomplish a very important task. Notice what Paul says 
Concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are able to admonish one another. Paul was convinced that Roman believers were able to admonish one another. Now, there's a relationship between this third point and the other two. The ability to admonish is dependent on the being full of goodness and the being filled with all knowledge. If you are not filled with goodness, that is the Holy Spirit work of a moral quality of excellence with a specific interest in the welfare of others, you're not ready to admonish. If you're not filled with goodness, if you don't have someone else's benefit, their Christ-likeness in view, then you're not ready for the ministry that Paul lays out here. And secondly, you're not able to admonish if you have not been filled with that comprehensive knowledge that God-pleasing admonishment will demand. You need to know your Bible. You need to know God's Word. If you want to be about the business of helping each other through life's problems with God's truth, you must know God's truth. It's a simple idea. But this is absolutely critical to understanding what Paul means by Roman believers being able to admonish. And this has been translated a number of different ways, able to instruct, able to comfort, able to encourage, able to admonish. Um, some English translations translate this competent to counsel. I've taken that as the title for the message this morning. The word here for admonish is nuthateo. We don't talk about a lot of Greek words on a Sunday morning, uh, but this is one you might recognize if you've been around the biblical counseling word. It is the word by, from which we get nuthetic counseling. In fact, it is the word that one pastor just coined the term nuthetic counseling to represent the truth of this text. And we'll talk about that a little bit later this morning. Nuthateo is a compound word uh, built on two words. The first word is nous the mind, the other is tithemi, to place or to put. And it has etymological roots. I mean, if you just put those two words together, it originally just meant to put to the mind, to place in the mind. But in its earliest usages that we can go back and read from Plato and other early Greek writers, this word came to mean to admonish, that is to warn, to bring truth to the mind specifically in the face of something that needed to be corrected, some obstacle, some problem, that is to impart understanding so as to affect the will when a warning needs to be given or a correction needs to be made. This is not just a data dump. To admonish means I'm going to come to you and tell you the truth to keep you from harm. And so do you understand why being full of goodness is so critical here? You have to be good and know what good is and be seeking the interest of the good of the other to do this thing called admonishment. And why it's so critical that you must be filled with a comprehensive knowledge of God's words on the matters of the problems that someone is dealing with. If you're going to bring truth to bear to someone's obstacle, someone's problem, someone's difficulty, and, and you want to speak in such a way that the truth of God affects their will so that they avoid some tragedy or correct some error, then you need to know the truth. You need to know which truths speak to these problems. Paul was convinced that the Roman believers had what it took to do just that. Ordinary, common, Christian ministry. Christian to Christian. He believed, you Roman believers, you yourselves are able to admonish. Competent to counsel. 
Now, this word is used specifically of the ministry of pastors in a number of places. By the way, uh, nine times in the New Testament this is used, all of Paul. Uh, this is one of Paul's uh, kind of favorite terms to describe pastoral ministry. Colossians 1.28, he described his own ministry this way. We proclaim Jesus, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. And you see there Paul's impetus. He was impelled by this good motive. He wants to see people made like Christ. And he was relentless in it. He was relentless in it. And it included admonishing every man and teaching every man. Again, nobody is beyond needing admonishment. We all need course correction. There was nobody in Paul's purview that he thought, well, I only need to admonish that person and that person. No, he says admonishing every man with the goal of bringing them into conformity with the Lord Jesus Christ. And admonishing and teaching, those two words go together often uh, in the Apostle Paul and in extra-biblical literature. Uh, positively teaching truth, but also admonishing, that is, warning about errors and bringing course correction that affects the will. Acts 20.31, Luke is writing technically, but Paul is speaking. Luke's recording Paul's words here. Therefore, be on the alert, Paul says to the Ephesian elders, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Paul used this word to describe his own ministry as an apostle and as a pastor. We see this ministry for pastors and everybody else in the church on display in 1 Thessalonians 5. Paul says in verses 12 to 14 of 1 Thessalonians 5, We request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you. They have charge over you in the Lord, and they give you admonition. There's the noun form of the word. And that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, all Christians, ordinary Christian ministry, Christian to Christian in the church, here's a command, admonish the unruly. Admonish the unruly. That is, those who are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Bring truth as a warning. So that they understand the trajectory they are on leads to destruction. You understand trajectory is a direction and a velocity. As someone is going somewhere and you can be one degree off and not be far off from each other spatially but you add velocity to that. You go in that one degree off for a long way and you can be miles apart, miles from the truth, miles from what is good, miles from Christ-likeness. So the task of a pastor and the task of every Christian includes this task of admonishment. We've done it already this morning together, all of us out loud at the same time. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you and with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. He recognizes the songs we have sung already this morning and the song we'll close with represent a heart of worship that is not exactly in keeping with our real lives. <laughs> I hope you sing better than you live, but I hope you aim to live like you sing. Right? We mean the words. Intend them. Pray them. Long for them to be true in increasing measure in your life. And all of those songs that we sing with a high view of God and a right view of our predicament and a longing for holiness, they're good songs and they are a rebuke to us, aren't they? They're an admonishment. They're an encouragement for us to correct what is erring, to bring our hearts and our affections in line with the Lord of the universe as they should be. And listen, one day we'll sing, and we'll mean it, and we'll live it. In one sense, those are prayers for us now, aims, and, and fruitful ones. This word is also used in direction to parents, Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and admonition, same word, instruction in the New American Standard of the Lord. Dads, give positive instruction, and sometimes you've got to grab the wheel. 
Listen, this is the expectation of a healthy church and of maturing believers. This is normal Christian life, normal Christian ministry. This is what it means to be the church, to be with each other, and to be in each other's lives such that heart motives come out by the mouth the word or by the mouth the heart speaks. We be around each other enough and we interact with one another, one another enough. And, and if you do that long enough, you're going to get sinned against and that's good. That means we're close enough to each other to see what's going on in the heart. Right? Don't get offended when Christians sin against you. It means you're close enough to be sinned against. But it also puts on display what goes on in the heart and then we can come into each other's lives and bring truth to bear to words and motives and behaviors that are not only displeasing to the Lord and harmful to the church, but potentially destructive as a trajectory away from the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is supposed to be normal, regular Christian life. Paul wasn't able to give this commendation to every church. He couldn't tell the Corinthian believers, you're so full of goodness, you ought to be admonishing each other. He, he gave some sharp rebukes, but he recognized in particular their selfishness blinded them to blatant sins in their own midst. They needed a lot of growing to do. The writer to Hebrews could not say to his audience, that you have allowed the word of God to course through your veins so well and to give you discernment in your personal life at the heart level between what is right and what is wrong, what is pleasing to the Lord and what is displeasing to Him. You haven't practiced that well enough to be able to be commended in this way. In fact, he writes, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You've come to need milk and not solid food. Everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. Solid food is for the mature. Who are the mature? Those who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. What does it mean for the Roman believers to be full of goodness and to be filled with all knowledge? It means they have that quality of moral excellence that the word of God produces in the life that overflows into an interest in the welfare of other people and is governed by that comprehensive knowledge of the Word of God, which presents the standard to which we are to encourage one another. And if you are not practiced to train your senses to discern good and evil at the heart level, you are going to be of little help to your brother and sister in the church. And yet this is the expectation for normal Christian ministry. The title of this morning's message is a tribute to Jay Adams. Uh, Jay Adams was a pastor. He went home to be with Christ just two months ago, November 14th of 2020. And when I read that news, uh, I couldn't help but think that Romans 15, 14 was right around the corner. His book, Competent to Counsel, is titled after this phrase in this verse. He was 91 years old, and he lived a long, full, industrious life, had a remarkable work ethic. He was brilliant. He was uh, actually precocious as a child, and at 15 years old, skipped some high school so that he could graduate. He didn't grow up in a Christian home. He came to faith when a friend of his who was a Christian was ardently defending the Bible against a skeptic, and Jay Adams thought, why are you so upset about the Bible? And he went and got his father's World War I army issue Gideon's New Testament, started reading the Gospel of John, and got saved before it was done. And a really remarkable about Jay Adams' testimony of salvation mirrored his life because he saw the power of God firsthand to give self-attestation to the transforming power of the gospel. And then the rest of his entire life was an outflow of that conviction. He was a presuppositionalist, 
in the sense that he presupposed the Bible's truth, the Bible's clarity, and importantly for his life and ministry, the Bible's sufficiency to address life problems. He is called the father of modern biblical counseling movement. He is the founder of NANC, that is the National Association of Nuthetic Counselors. There's our nuthateo word from this verse. He's the one that coined that word because he was afraid every counseling fad gets a label. Uh, I don't want somebody else to put a wrong label on there. I'm going to put the label on it, and I think it's called nuthetic. That's how that word came about. NANC became ACBC, the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors, um, we are an ACBC training center in this church. I think we have fourth generation J. Adams disciples discipling a fifth generation of people to handle God's word to deal with people's life problems. He was a pastor who wrote 100 books, including a, an entire set of commentaries and an English translation of the Greek New Testament. And his life's mission, he loved preaching, he loved pastoring, and he sort of fell backwards into the counseling movement. He, he wanted to defend the Bible for pastors. And when Jay Adams went to seminary at 15 years old, <clears throat> that's another story, I'll leave that out. Um, he fell in love with the original languages. He fell in love with pastoral ministry and preaching. And yet, there hadn't been a book written on how to care for souls from a pastoral perspective in a hundred years. And he was troubled. What do I do? And, and when he went to Westminster Seminary in his first year as a new faculty member teaching a preaching course, they said, hey, we don't have anybody to teach counseling. Will you do it? And he took the notes of the previous professor and taught one semester a one-hour counseling course from the old notes. And he just couldn't stomach it. What, what is this? And, and all that was available at the time uh, were, were the results of the Freudian revolution. You've no doubt heard of Freud and Jung and, and their disciples. The Freudian revolution boiled down to this. We need to remove the idea of responsibility for behavior from the one acting out. So someone who's experiencing a crisis, someone who is acting out a result of that crisis, we cannot hold them responsible for their behavior. We have to replace an indictment with a diagnosis. And so Freud set out very intentionally to replace behavioral problems, to label those, excuse me, with medical vocabulary. This is where we get the ideas of mental health, mental wellness, and mental illness. And as soon as you take the idea of somebody's doing something wrong into the realm of, oh, there's something wrong with them, you evoke immediate empathy, acceptance, give them space, and have a lot of understanding. And one of the disciples of Freudian psychology that took this to another fad level was a guy named Rogers, and Rogerian psychotherapy was essentially just be a wall be a listener, and let the counselee bounce their ideas off the wall, and eventually they'll fix themselves. Do not ever, ever impart truth. Dogma's off the table. And you see the problem already with psychoanalytic therapy. You, you tell the conscience, in Freud's world, that is the superego. You tell the conscience to stop firing off and stop defeating my subconscious natural impulses. That's my id, so that my conscious self, my ego, can function better. Look, I'm going to function a lot better if my warning system inside about right and wrong just quits firing. So psychotherapy's goal, its entire hope, its entire strategy of getting better and getting functional after years and years and years of therapy is just stop feeling like you're doing something wrong. And of course, there are ways to change the way you feel. Blunting the conscience is one of those. Medication is another one of those. Uh, institutionalization in the early 20th century uh, was kind of the way to deal with undealable with problems. 
and in institutions, patients were subjected to an array of experimental trends and fads along the Freudian, Jungian, Rogerian pathway. In the 1960s, virtually all pastoral counseling textbooks followed Freud's presuppositions. There is no God, everything is materialism, and it is all about animal survival. And the goal, a stated goal by Freud in print, was to give the pastor's job to the psychologist. Staggering. The doctor deals with real biological medical things, but anything related to life and problems must go to the psychiatrist and the psychologist. Where does that leave the pastor? Oh, you can just say whatever truth claims you want, but you can't get into telling people what to do. And essentially, all the 1960s era pastoral counseling textbooks that Jay Adams encountered imbibed those presuppositions and told the pastor, refer, defer. You have no business dealing with the real problems of life. Those are reserved for the psychologist. And even many Christian psychologists beginning in that era told the Christian pastors to stay in their lane. One atheist who was a psychologist who had seen no fruit from Freudian tactics and who began to see remarkable responses when he demanded that his patients take responsibility for their actions, said to Jay Adams, has evangelical Christianity sold its birthright for a mess of psychological pottage? And that was an indictment from someone who didn't believe the Bible and didn't believe in God. And so Jay Adams went into the second year of his counseling class that he had to teach. And he said, I need to get to work. I believe on paper the word of God is sufficient. I believe that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. But how does the Bible address these issues that people are dealing with in real life? Does it? And it began what became a life quest to answer that question. It was an apologetic. It was a defense for the sufficiency of the word of God. And his primary aim was to equip pastors to the task of soul care. Don't give up on your duty, pastors. And the byproduct of that was an equipping of an army of believers to see their regular, ordinary ministry in the church is Romans 15, 14. Full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, competent to counsel able to admonish. Of course, that's what he named his book 50 years ago. Uh, he never intended to publish it. Those were the class notes that somebody got a hold of and scurried away to a publisher. I, I've, I've reread about 70% of it just this last week, and I had read it 20 years ago. Didn't appreciate it. Um, the principles that he wrote 50 years ago have turned out not to be the latest fad or trend in mental health care. While those fads and trends have changed in the world around us in those 50 years, and they'll change again next week, the biblical principles and the biblical truths that he courageously outlined nearly alone have stood the test of time. One of his biographers said, he wrote as a pastor making an appeal for the Bible. And listen, when we read Romans 15, 14, we're not here just flattering the Roman Christians. What are we doing? We're recognizing the quality, the breadth and scope and sufficiency of the Bible itself to address man's problems. Man is who man has been since God created him. And God has not left us adrift without God's solutions for life problems until Freud came along. He's given us what we need. And there have been many men who have stood alone in church history for the defense of the truth of God's word. J. Adams was a unique one in the area of soul care. If you want to know more about that, by the way, you can email Tom Angstead if you'd like to be trained in how do I find the passages and deal with them accurately to help out the specific problems that I'm faced with. 
Uh, how do I help other people face those things? Uh, you can sign up for biblical counseling training. The bottom line in all of this is you need to know God's word. Because someone who is, has the fruit of the Spirit and who knows God's word is able to admonish. That is to bring course correction in the difficult things of life. Now, I know for some of you, I probably have opened a can of worms. And there is so much that goes along with what I've said in in just a very introductory form here. If you're curious about what this neuthetic counseling side of things is, or if this makes you wonder, wait, is the Word of God truly sufficient? I thought the the doctor was for the body, the pastor was for the, the spirit, and the psychologist was for the soul, or something along those lines. If this is new for you, don't hesitate to reach out to to one of the shepherds in his church. We'd love to walk you through why we believe and how we've seen fruit from believing in the sufficiency of the Word of God to deal with life's problems. Course corrections are necessary in life. Listen, you and I should not be offended when someone steps into our life with truth and says, hey, can I ask you about your trajectory? Seems off just a little bit. Don't be offended at that. That's normal Christian living. In fact, um, we return the favor in due season. We have each other's backs in this. This is the expectation of a healthy church. This was Paul's commendation of the Roman church. We speak into each other's lives, able to admonish, competent to counsel one another, full of goodness and filled with comprehensive knowledge of God's Word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You. You know us. You know us better than we know ourselves. You have given us Your Word, which truly is able to restore the soul. I thank You for gifted men and women in this church who have so faithfully opened Your Word, trusting implicitly in its power to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart, to bring about God-pleasing living, even in the midst of very trying circumstances. We trust your word. We pray that we would be increasingly well-equipped with your word to serve one another. And we ask it in Jesus' name.